Good morning and welcome to the eighth meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the public gallery to please switch off or onto silent your electronic devices so they don't affect the committee's work this morning. We have apologies today from Alex Neil, MSP. Item one is decision to take business in private. Can we agree to take items three and four in private this morning, please? Agreed. Thank you. Item two is the 2016-17 audit of NHS Tayside. I'd like to welcome our first panel of witnesses today, Professor Sir Lewis Ritchie, Chair of NHS Tayside Assurance and Advisory Group, Caroline Lamb, Chief Executive NHS Education for Scotland and Chair of the NHS Tayside Transformation Support Team, and Alan Gray, Director of Finance, NHS Grampian, who I understand has served on both the Assurance and Advisory Group and the Transformation Support Team. I will open with the first question this morning. When we invited you to give evidence, it was to explore the detail of the second report of the Assurance and Advisory Group. And your covering letter, uh, Sir Lewis, uh, states that the rating assigned by the TST to the financial current position has moved from red to amber, reflecting the progress made in reducing the actual and projected level of NHS Tayside's financial shortfall. You also said at senior executive team level, we are encouraged by indications of improved organisational grip of the financial situation. <coughs> now, since then, we have had revelations that £5.3 million of e-health funds has been misrecorded in NHS Tayside accounts and that the 1718 financial outturn is likely to deteriorate further. Can you please tell the committee this morning why we should have confidence in the rest of your report under these circumstances? Thank you for your invitation to attend here today uh, on behalf of my colleagues and myself. We were not made aware of this uh, financial uh, misreporting of the position during the organisation and conduct of our review and subsequent assessment of progress. Um, this is a matter that came to light uh, when the, your own committee was informed about it. As far as I was concerned, this is the first time that I saw this. So our assessment of progress was based on what was reported to the board up until the end of January and as we saw it. In our report, we talked about improved uh, grip. Uh, we talked about evidence of better team working, leadership, and that's detailed in the Transformation Support Team report, the second uh, report which Caroline Lamb uh, led upon. And uh, that is why we felt that the tide was turning, but there was much further to go in this matter. So you said you were not made aware. Um, I think there were other people in that situation as well on these funds. But are you confident that you were made aware of enough of what is going on in, to, to complete your report, Sir Lewis? My view is that this is a work in progress. Transformation takes quite some time. Uh, when I decided to accept the uh, commission, I felt that while it was important to address immediate financial concerns around grip, around the gap between budgeting uh, and uh, control and operational performance, I felt it was important that we looked, took a sort of root and branch look at how services were being delivered in Tayside. Because transformation takes time, it takes ownership, it takes leadership. And to correct the financial position of NHS Tayside, which has been uh, in progress for some years, uh, will require massive transformation. And to set that process in place, it was important for us to know what was happening in terms of service delivery, what was being done in terms of the transformation programme. And our report pointed out that there was insufficient grip and insufficient clarity around the details of the transformation programme as it stood, that further external assistance was required, uh, both in terms of financial support, and that's uh, been uh, provided by Mr. Alan Gray and others, um, and also in terms of a gap in strategic planning. So in other words, unless these deficits were corrected, then any financial movement in the short term 
would be rather about transactional change rather than transformational change. And that is what's required and will be required on an ongoing basis to deliver sustainable budgetary financial control in Tayside. Can I ask you, uh, Sir Lewis, the, the kind of scope and how far into the organisation of NHS Tayside you went? Because any transformational change in any organisation requires um, team leaders on the ground to be bought into the transformational programme and to be delivering it in their own uh, areas. How far did your team go into the organisation, speak to lead clinicians on their specific projects about how transformation was happening? You will see from the annex to my first staging report the number of visits which I made. You know, I set aside all of my, personally, all of my other work for the three-month period that we conducted the initial work for the staging report. And I and my colleagues undertook many site visits. We met with many groups. We met with individuals at the coal face. We met with committees. We met with the board, both collectively and individually. I, myself, met with each executive team member uh, of NHS Tayside as part of our initial fact-finding exercise. OK, and apart from the management, we can come on to that later, in terms of on the ground, doctors and nurses and the uh, health professionals that you were speaking to, what was the, what was the sense of how transformational change could happen if, if it was being... Um, if it was happening, if they were being enabled to make it happen, if it was, if it was worthwhile, if it was going to yield results, what was the morale amongst them? My feeling was the, uh, and we stated in our report that there was a, a sense of a lack of buy-in by frontline staff, in particular, to the transformation uh, program, and the transformation program board, which we visited and witnessed. Uh, clearly held much of its business uh, in camera uh, uh, at the outset. So basically, there was, a, there was a feeling that engagement was not as early as it should be, was not as thorough as it should be. But equally, I spent many hours discussing, along with my colleagues, the n need for transformation with, in particular, clinical colleagues, because clinical leadership with support staff behind them is essential for transformation because transformation is a common endeavor. It's not something you do and you do it once. You have to keep on doing it. And that requires a high degree of ownership across the system. So you got a sense that from some frontline staff there wasn't complete buy-in. But did you get any sense of why that was? I think there's a, a misperception that transformation is something that can be done in a short space of time. Uh, there's a misperception uh, that um, what is planned in a boardroom is actually made clear at, at ground level and shared at ground level. Uh, and there's also the issue about when engagement in occurs, when should that occur? And we were saying it didn't occur early enough and that had to change. You think it is changing now? I understand from my observations and, and from the observations of others that that tide is turning. So, Lewis, with the um, revelation about the 5.3 million that has since, because your report was, I mean, I read your report before uh, this actually uh, came to Indeed. light. Indeed. How do you think something like that affects these team leaders on the ground where there's such a glaring omission, such a a glaring mistake at management level. How do you think that affects the confidence of the people who have to actually deliver this transformational change? My view, when I heard on the day that your committee heard about this, was one of disappointment. Because I was disappointed, clearly, not only in the financial hole that it opened up, but actually, your, your, your point I, I support, it will affect morale. And Having a high morale workforce is key for effective transformation. So my, my reaction, quite simply, when I heard about it, was disappointment. OK, thank you. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, everyone. Now, I wonder if I could just continue to tease out the issues that the, the convener has introduced there, uh, Professor Ritchie. Um, 
Why do you think it's taken so long? I mean, you, you said yourself it's, this has been an issue for some years, and NHST said the overall financial position. Why is it taking so long for it to dawn on the organisation that transformational change may, in fact, be required here? Um, that is a good question. Um, I, my answer to this is that um, if the tide is coming in in terms of resource development resources, as happened for, for many years in the NHS, basically it is easier to carry on doing incremental change. In other words, uh, moving a service here, a little bit there. Uh, but when the tide of resource begins to go out, then you begin to say, well, that's not sufficient. You can't just Im improve your financial position by improving your financial processes you have to actually look at service redesign. And that, I believe, because of the fact that, as it were, the tide has not been so generous, it's not been flowing in so much in terms of development monies, means that uh, the financial position is more exposed and the service is more exposed. And you will know, of course, that NHS Dayside has more sites, more personnel in most categories, greater energy expenditure, that has been going on for some time and indeed was the subject of a previous task force and Audit Scotland review in 2001. But clearly in the intervening years, insufficient attention has been made to, well, what do we really need to do to redesign our services in Tayside to make these services sustainable and continue to be high quality and safe? And, that's, and that is, these two latter characteristics are absolutely essential. And these kinds of questions have never really been considered or posed within the organisation to date, would you say? Uh, I, I fully believe, uh, as we found out during our uh, fact-finding uh, stage between uh, April and uh, June last year, that uh, the board is fully cited now on the need for transformation. I think what happened last time was recommendations were made uh, for, on the moment, on the year, and as business went back to usual, I think a sight was lost in this. Now there is a concerted uh, uh, effort, and I do not believe that the NHS Tayside and indeed its partners, and its partners will be port important for effective transformation, are other than cited and committed to make that change. But transformation will be neither quick nor easy. Difficult decisions lie ahead, that includes not only taking the public of Tayside but with the board and its partners, but clearly the political representatives in Tayside as well. Uh, you know, leadership of a very high order will be needed for this, and it will need to be concerted and continuous for some time. This is not the work of a year, let alone six months, which is what we were given, actually, to report progress to you at this point. And in my... Uh, uh, view and in the view of my colleagues on the uh, Assurance and Advisory Group, we made the comment and recommendation that scrutiny, external scrutiny by government of the activities of NHS Tayside should continue at a high level accordingly and progress further out from the recommendations having been published in the first place should be reassessed. Mm. So there should be no let up in this matter. The reason for dwelling on this, convener, is that we, we hear these sorts of messages fairly regularly at this committee and have done over the years. Are, are we, is it pointing at issues about capacity and skills and so on? Is it, is it governance issues? Is it guidance and regulation? What kind of, kind of set and suite of skills are we talking about here to try to introduce or bring to, to bear in an organisation that would prevent something like this happening in a year or so down the line? I would make several points. I, I might want to bring in Caroline Lamb in relation to her uh, assessment and support in, the, in relation to the workings of the transformation support team. But I, I preface that by saying uh, all of the aspects and items you mentioned will be important. And this is, this is, this is the, the rub, the, or the nub of the matter, rather, that transformation depends on many things coming together, not just one. You know, in the past, there would be a focus on this and a focus on that, and that's not peculiar to NHS Tayside. 
But transformation depends on a global perspective. It, it depends on many people doing things together that they might not have been doing before. A mutual understanding, effective leadership, and adequate support. And I now come to the, one of our recommendations to the government. We had 14 recommendations, as you're aware, 10 for Tayside and 4 for the government. And we uh, recognised, almost from the get-go of our uh, assessment, that external support would be required. The NHS Tayside could not go it alone. And I think that is the, the difference between our assessment and previous assessments, where financial adjustments were made, look, some local leadership was changed. We're actually saying we, need, we needed external support. Both well, Mr Gray on my left and Ms Lamb on my right and colleagues have, have tried to do that uh, since the staging report was published. So, Caroline, can I maybe uh, invite you to comment? Absolutely. So, um, the Assurance and Advisory Group, uh, as to Lewis's reference, issued 10 recommendations in relation to NHS Tayside. The other four were for Scottish Government. The role of the Tayside support team has been very much to provide support and constructive challenge in, to Tayside in implementing those recommendations. So it's not been about going in and doing it for them, it's been about very much supporting a team in situ to deliver on those recommendations. And if I was to ca characterise those recommendations, I think they, they cover the different elements that need to be in place for, for transformation. So very immediate um, recommendation, recommendation number one about it, the in-year financial position and needing to absolutely get a, a, an urgent grip on what that was looking like um, and then be able to manage that going forward. Uh, I think then a, a longer term recommendation around the importance and the absolute um, centrality of the integ integrated clinical strategy and the work on that towards being able to deliver medium and longer term financial sustainability and quality services um, across Tayside. And then linked to that is very much the recommendations that were about addressing some of the, the key areas um, of financial pressure ad ad identified by the Insurance and Advisory Group around workforce and around prescribing costs. And then you might categorise the second half of the recommend, and, and sorry, and improve business planning. You might characterise the second half of the recommendations around delegation, around engagement, around corporate structures, around scrutiny, and particularly around leadership development as being fundamental to creating the conditions that are required to support transformation, which isn't an overnight activity. It isn't something that you set off to do today and it's done by the end of the week or the end of the month. It is a long-term activity that needs absolutely to build relationships, to build confidence, to build trust, uh, and it does take some time. I mean, thank you so much for that, but it would still worry me, I would say, that we've, we've waited perhaps six years or so to start to begin the journey towards real transformational change in the NHS side and that. So I, I'm not quite sure how to take what you're saying with some degree of comfort, but I'm certainly assured that we are now thinking along those lines and, and that is our intent and purpose now to, to bring that to bear within the organisation. But very lastly, convener, could you just give us a brief glimpse, a brief practical example of some of the transformational change that you see so that people perhaps watching this can understand that we're just speaking out in general terms at the moment, could you give us a practical example of what you see as a, a change that's required in NHS Tayside to bring these changes around? I think it's important to recognise that there has been progress made, and I think it's important to recognise that um, although... You know, the yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if I just look at the um, improved information and data that the board now have available to them on their workforce, on where their workforce is deployed, that is enabling them on, on, on the improved partnership working around the vacancy management group, that means that both staff side and management are sitting down and actually talking about how to manage the staffing establishment. And that did start to show some evidence of reductions in the requirement for expend on nursing agency staff particularly, which we know is not just expensive but also not the best way of providing services to patients. Now, clearly that's been difficult to sustain during the winter period, but the foundations have been set to continue to deliver that. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Clearly, a key element of uh, this whole transformation is really the bottom line, isn't it? I mean, it's all about uh, bringing Tayside back into some sort of balance. Um, to what extent are you satisfied that the 
information coming from the finance area, particularly given this revelation, is actually accurate. In terms of what we uh, have been given, um, we have looked at it and uh, with the support of EY initially, we decided to, to uh, uh, take a... Public's a a dual. Yes. A, 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 now it used to be known as Ernst and Young. It's now called EY. Right. Uh, it, so, so basically, we decided that uh, in order to do the work initially, we had to do this in a parallel way. And so, EY, Ernst and Young, formerly were commissioned to to do a, a deep dive on the financial situation in Tayside in relation to their budgets and so on. So, we had the benefit when we came to our view in June. Uh, not only of our own views, but uh, an audit undertaken by EY on our behalf. This was yourself commissioned that? It, Scottish, Scottish Government commissioned it at the outset. How much did that cost? I am not aware of that. I wasn't informed about it. OK. But I didn't commission it. It was commissioned uh, at the outset by Scottish Government. Alan, can you... Do you it was uh, commissioned by Scottish Government, and we used it to rely on that as part of our findings for the, the first report mm -hmm. in June, so we didn't commission it. Yes, we can do that. Yeah. 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 Can I ask that question? Thanks. Sir Lewis. Yeah, <clears throat> I am always uh, sceptical about what people tell me about finances because I've served in boards for a number of years and it's always good to be uh, sceptical uh, in relation to any response and in particular in relation to money uh, and therefore uh, it was important that NHS Tayside received external financial support rapidly. And that support has largely come uh, in the form of uh, input from Alan Gray on my left and colleagues. Alan, of course, is re lead, financial, uh, uh, lead finance director for the north of Scotland and has been helping Tayside directly. And Alan, you may wish to comment yeah, on that. I recognise the point you're making around the clarity of the financial information that was presented to the board. Uh, and to other users within the organisation in terms of managing the budget. So some revisions have been made to that in terms of the financial reporting, so it's clearer in terms of actually what the underlying financial position is and how the overall financial position is being managed. Some, some steps have been made to change the quality of the financial reporting that's going to the board. Uh, my colleagues mentioned this in the second session. We wish to talk about what they've done in recent uh, weeks to improve that clarity. We presented that format, revised format, back to the board uh, on Monday of this week, and I think uh, received very positive feedback. So part of it is actually making sure the users of the information understand the financial position. And I think previously, if you look at some information, it could have been presented in a different way that made it easier for you know, a non a non financial person to understand the financial position and to be able to ask then questions. Because part of the role of non executive is to be able to scrutinise and challenge. If you're not provided with information, a format allows you to do that, then that makes that job that much more difficult. So the format of reporting now should make it much easier for non-executive members with no financial background to be able to ask and challenge questions on the financial position of the, of the board. And by scepticism, I meant an important scrutiny role and challenge role, uh, not uh, an unhealthy scepticism about what, what people are telling me, but actually the fact that you need to look very carefully at the evidence, listen very carefully to what people uh, say, and, and challenge them accordingly. Yeah. And I mean, that's a process. Yeah. I mean, clearly, you're very reliant on the reliability of the information coming to you. And clearly, from the uh, review that's been done here, there was a lack of control over part of the, the process here. If EY did a deep audit, audit or deep look at the uh, financial situation, how it was being managed and so on. Um, are you surprised that this came to light now and not as part of that uh, audit process? Uh, no, I'm not, um, because a forensic analysis of uh, the financial systems within NHS TSA was not part of their remit. They were there to look at how Tayside was financing its transformation programme uh, and, and they reported accordingly. In other words, they did what they were asked to do. So they weren't reporting on actually systems and approvals and all the rest of it? Uh, no, that would be the role of your external auditors. So Audit Scotland, the role of external auditors would be looking at the systems and processes through which the financial information was produced. Uh, Ernst Young's remit was to look at actually the overall financial position, the underlying deficit and the factors contributing towards that. So it was not a financial audit. I think it was from the term in-depth. It, 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 it was in-depth in terms of looking at and, and analysing 
the drivers for why the financial position was where it was, what the factors contributing towards that. So that was their role. Uh, the, the external auditor role would be, an internal auditor role would be to look and examine the systems of control and process and governance within the organisation and report that back to the board. And the coming, back, coming back to the, the, the core element in this, how satisfied are you now that the reporting you're receiving, the information that you're relying on, is accurate? Because a few weeks ago it wasn't. Yeah, so I think there's still some further work ongoing to clarify the financial position. Uh, there's a whole series of questions been asked around review and challenge to make sure that we do understand uh, all aspects of the financial position and what's contributed towards that. So that work is ongoing. Uh, and part of the position that's been reforecast, we're reforecasting the year end position for NHS Tayside to reflect some of that review. That work will take a few more weeks to conclude. Clearly, you've got the audit. Sorry, I'll, Sorry I was just going to say, just to make sure I'm not misinterpreting what you're saying. You're saying that at this moment we don't actually know what the financial position will be. There, there's still elements being worked out. There's still uncertainties. Okay. So what we've done is, so, sorry, Jeremy. Yes. If it was to be reported to the board meeting on Monday, the revised projected deficit, correct. is that correct? Correct, that's indeed. And, and those papers are, those minutes are not yet public. Can you tell us, Mr. Gray, what that figure was? Yeah, the, four, the, 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 position, the, the deficit position at month 11 was £11 million, pounds, just over £11 million. Pounds, and the reforecast position, based on information we know to date, we're forecasting an outturn of £12.1 million pounds for the end that of the year. It was reported to the board on Monday, was it? Indeed it was. OK, thank you. Colin. And it was also reported in as part of the, the this return to Scottish government, so that was part of our financial reporting. We're asked to, you know, do a, an in-year, an in-month position, but also a, an end-of-year position. And clearly, we're getting close to the end of the year, so we should be able to clarify that, that, clarify that position. Has, has this uh, this issue that's arisen created any doubt in your minds about the uh, the accuracy of the information you're getting? Because I'm quite, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that uh, we're in a situation here where, yeah, this is po we've had problems continuously for some years. We think we've got our hands around it, and suddenly this pops up. And of course, it creates that doubt as to whether there's something else there. Yeah, I get, and I guess that's why we're asking lots of questions. So we're not going to throw every line of areas that, you know, in, in terms of you know, the mm. financial position to make sure that we understand all the component parts that are adding to the financial position. And, 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 and we'll see what we get to over the next few weeks in terms of confirming that view. I, I can only know what I know just now. Uh, I'm asking as many questions as I can with the finance team and colleagues around that. Uh, we've got an external audit clearly coming up in the next few weeks, and again, I'm hoping that you know that, that also contributes to improving the understanding of the financial position. What about, the role, what about the role of internal audit in this? I mean, are you making use of? Uh, yeah, internal audit has been very helpful in terms of identifying control weaknesses and improvements. So again, we're working through with them in terms of understanding how many of these control actions have been taken forward and implemented. So again, there's ongoing discussions with internal audit in terms of the role they can play. Audit didn't pick this one up. And, and to be fair, to internal, internal audit did flag the use of. Uh, uh, of the kind of uh, the deferred expenditure as a, as, a, as a means for managing the financial position. So to be fair to internal audit, they had highlighted that there was an area of 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 of, of weakness within the financial controls in the organisation. What the, flag that too, Mr. Kerr. They flagged up. If you look at the, the in our assurance and advisory committee, we highlight uh, a number of instances where they've highlighted to the audit committee and the board uh, the use of deferred expenditure. We referenced it also in our report. Uh, Tell. So, sorry, Jen. No, sorry, Colin. So are you telling us that the internal audit had flagged this use of e-health funds no, to no, the board No, no, so I'll clarify, no, 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 so I'll clarify that. So they're, they're within that category of funds for which they, we call deferred expenditure, the e-health money was one component part. They, they, wouldn't, they, didn't, they did not identify that. It would have been difficult for them to flag that up, I think. Uh, so what had they identified? What they had identified was that, uh, explain how the board's financial position is managed. So we, we are asked to work within a single revenue resource limit for in any financial year. Uh, so that, that, that comprises your, your board, your, co your core board allocation your, under the NRAC formula, your money for general med medical services, and also covers what we call earmarked funding. Earmarked funding is allocated to boards all the way through the year, uh, and often that earmarked funding will require to be spent over more than one financial year. So, uh, so in terms of what what been happening on the side is that the, the, the level of earmarked funding that had been allocated to the board had not been spent as quickly as it should have been, uh, and it was building up within the financial position. So at the end of last year, there was £23 million of earmarked funding that hadn't been committed in year that would be carried forward into future years. And within that £23 million of allocations, there was the £5.3 million of e-health allocations. Now, 
I, I, I would, would have been easy for them to say a lot to pick out what these allocations were. I suspect in the way that that was reported, it wouldn't be difficult for them to pick out specifically what the nature of these funds were and what the source of these funds were. It would have been difficult for internal audit to pick out. Yeah. Colin, did you want to continue with this line of questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious why it would be difficult for internal audit. I mean, they have the right to look into anything that uh, they have a concern about. It's not, it's not a small sum. You may say it's a small sum in relation to the overall budget of the board, yeah. but still five million odd pounds to me you know, buys an awful lot of goods for the hospital. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking what uh, the board actually received here. Is there anything there? If, it's, if something's been highlighted by internal audit, do you think the board would have been concerned about it? Would they have investigated? Yeah, the board were concerned. The board, board had taken steps to, to reduce their dependence on that level of deferred expenditure. Last year, 23, the board were taking steps to reduce that. So the board were taking all the steps they felt were the right steps to improve that position and reduce reliance on this type of money and make sure that earmarked earmark funding was getting used much more quickly to support the provision of services. So I think the board had taken on board the, the, the findings from internal audit and were taking these forward in terms of implementing the actions. Coming back to, again, the, the money... From your perspective, do you have a timescale within which you believe that you will have satisfied yourself that the finance side is 100% in order and that we can rely on the figures coming out? Yeah. Coming back to this particular issue, of course, that creates the doubt, doesn't it? I, I would agree. There's a bit of building trust and confidence, again, in terms of the financial information, the quality of that information we present to the board, so no doubt about that. I think it's going to take a bit of time to do that. I think we have reassigned responsibility in the finance function. There are a number of reviews ongoing to try and identify you know, what further action needs to be taken. We're going to get internal audit in to help us. I think uh, the board are minded to also uh, commission an independent review, and that was highlighted in a letter to Paul Gray. So all these factors should help us be able to then come up with a clear action plan about how we improve the controls within the finance function and the quality of the financial reporting. So I can't give you a final timeline for that. My aim would be to get as much of that done by the end of June so that you can have confidence going into the next financial year uh, that, uh, that the information being produced is reliable and the board can make huge decisions on the basis of that information. Do you want to come in yes, on this? Yes, and that, that is another reason why we uh, continue to um, recommend regular scrutiny by the government of the financial affairs of Tayside and indeed to uh, um, undertake a further review in the next financial year at a suitable point. So the answer is uh, this requires continued scrutiny. This is a work in progress. Have you taken any steps to have discussions with internal audit in particular about the scope of their audit and whether it needs to be beefed up or whether it's adequate as it is, at least for the interim period, until you're satisfied? Yes, I'm due to have a meeting next week with the Chief Internal Auditor to, to understand what's currently in the programme of work for the remainder of this year and for next year to see what we can do to try and reprioritise some of that work to help us indeed address some of the issues that have been highlighted in the Grant Thornton report and were widely been internal audit in previous years. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> we've heard uh, uh, quite a bit about clarifying the financial position, about reforecasting, uh, requirement of scrutiny uh, into NHS Tayside's financial affairs. Now, in late February, the Director of Finance decided to retire uh, after some 35 years. And this was confirmed, I think, there was a letter from Leslie McClay to Paul Gray, in which this was referenced in one line. Uh, are you able to tell us why the Director of Finance uh, suddenly disappeared and in what circumstances? Sir Lewis. Uh, uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, I only became aware uh, of the uh, findings uh, of financial misreporting at the same time your committee was. I have been, I certainly have had no uh, part whatsoever to play uh, in the circumstances and indeed any corrective actions following our report which was submitted uh, a month ahead of this particular item coming to the attention of the government and indeed NHS Tayside. Doesn't that rather concern you? Uh, it, it, it does, but that is not within my remit. You're asking me, does it concern me? Yes. Is it within our remit? Uh, or was it within our remit? The answer to that is no. And I suspect you may wish to tease this out further in the next session. Uh, uh, forgive me, I've just been kind of blindsided a bit there. You're in there... Mm. To, to look after the transformation. The Director of Finance 
uh, who apparently has presided over a situation that we've explored in some detail, has just disappeared. And I think if I'm hearing you right, Sir Lewis, you're not asking questions around that. Is that correct? My role at the moment has is, is been uh, completed by the uh, presentation of a second report. I have, however, since been asked to go in to do a further uh, assessment of progress uh, in September with Caroline Lamb. That may change in the light of the circumstances which I'm not fully aware of. Yes. Mr Gray, uh, do you have any view on this? No, I can't comment on it. All I've been asked, all I can say is that I've been, I've been asked and offered to provide some interim financial support to the board, and I'm doing that in my current capacity. Uh, but I can't, uh, I wasn't involved in any discussions around the retirement uh, of the previous Director of Finance. All I can confirm to, to you as a committee that I've been tasked with giving some support to the finance team uh, and to the board at this particular point in time. And that remains my focus for the next few weeks until I can be happy that uh, we can move this uh, situation forward and look at, and there's a board thing, a paper coming to the board today to look at an appointment of a, either an interim or a permanent Director of Finance going forward to take that re responsibility on for the foreseeable future. Well, on that note then, are you, uh, is there any cost incurred uh, as a result of this resignation, either for your own services or for, I understand, there's been a realignment amongst the finance team? Uh, Confirm that no, no, there's no payment for my time. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a regional structure now, the, you know, the north of Scotland region. Uh, I've agreed with my board that I can be released from, from my current duties, or part of my current duties, to support the board. I've been doing that for a period of weeks now. Uh, and that goes with the blessing of my, my board that I can do that. Uh, so, that so there's no cost in current days. There's no additional capacity. I'm not, we're not bringing any additional capacity into the finance team at this particular point in time. I am looking at what's in the finance team in terms of capacity capability. Uh, and if we determine there's a need to improve uh, the capacity in that team, uh, I would take that forward to the board uh, as a recommendation. But at this stage, there is no additional investment of resource in the finance team or cost being incurred by Tayside as a result of the retirement of the Director of Finance. Is it your view that there is appropriate financial leadership in place at NHS Tayside? Uh, and perhaps more importantly, do you take a view that there has been appropriate financial leadership in the past and will there be in the future? During my initial review, I uh, met with all of the executive team. I, I mentioned that earlier um, and I asked the question, um, are you confident that you have the necessary skills, leadership in all the areas that are required for effective transformation going forward? Now, primarily, that is a matter for the board to satisfy itself that that is the case. However, we did immediately, as you are aware, uh, suggest to the government that additional external support was required, particularly in relation to finance and particularly in relation to strategic planning, and indeed to make that uh, more granular, to see what detail was required, the transformation support team was established to do that. I think I'll rest now. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Can I just mention, first of all, that um, in the papers we look at today, there's reference to a report by KPMG. I uh, just remind members that uh, my register of interest says I was a partner in KPMG, but of course had no part to play in, in right. any of this, this work. C can I just ask um, um, Professor Ritchie just one question? You've spoken quite a lot about leadership and the importance of it in the future and, and this transformation um, that's at the head of NHS Tayside. Who is the leader on whose shoulders that, that burden now, now falls? Leadership is something that is required at all levels in NHS Tayside, not just at board level. Transformation has to be led not by the board only, but primarily by the board. Uh, but clinical leadership, for example, will be very important going forward in relation to transformation. Transformation will not happen without buy-in and without the clinical leaders in, in Tayside continuing to rise to the occasion. So what you're saying is there are a group of leaders. Who is the leader of that group of leaders then? Who is the, well, the, the leader of...? The, the, the chairman of the board leads, leads the activities of the board supported by the accountable officer who is the chief executive. And that's where it starts, basically. 
Okay. But, it, but leadership has to be evident among non executives, yeah, it needs to be evident throughout the organisation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gray, you said that. Um, on the question Colin Beattie asked you about internal audit, you said that the board were aware of the deferred expenditure, including the 5.3 million. I don't see the fact, no, I'll clarify, the deferred expenditure generally, they were not aware of the 5.3 normal internal audit. None of us were aware of that situation. That was only known about in the last few weeks, and none of us were aware of that situation. But that deferred expenditure did include the 5.3 million? It did indeed. That's correct. Okay. And when you said the board were aware of the deferred expenditure, um, in what way were they aware? Aware was it reported to a board meeting, or can so, you clarify uh, that be, for be us? Through, certainly through audit committee meetings, I guess the reports of internal audit would go to audit committee. I can't clarify in terms of need whether it went to a board meeting, but certainly went. Sorry, to, can you speak a little bit slowly? Sorry, because yeah, I beg your pardon. Sorry, what? it went to a number of board meet, a number of audit committee meetings. The internal audit reports would go to a number of audit committee meetings in which these uh, these references were made to the use of deferred expenditure as part of the financial position. Now, whether that went to a forward board meeting, I can't comment. Uh, but uh, they certainly went to an audit committee meeting and were considered there. They were also referenced in our assurance and advisory report, which did go to the board meeting, and we do make references to the use of deferred expenditure in that report, the report in June of 2017. Ian Gray. I, I, I mean, this is quite puzzling. So that there was a, a sum of deferred expenditure of 20, 20 million, 20 million pounds. pounds, and the audit committee and the board were aware of that, they had, uh, I think Sir Lewis said, they had expressed a view, or a view had been expressed, that some grip had to be taken of that situation. In other words, the failure to spend money in time and therefore the need to defer it had to be improved. That's right. Surely in that process, the audit committee and or the board must have asked, what is this deferred expenditure? What is the activity for which we have allocated funds which are not being spent in a year. And if they did that, how can it possibly be that they weren't told that £5.3 million, a quarter of it almost, was the e-health money? That, I, I, I can't see how that's possible. So I, I can't actually comment on what the Audit Committee may or may not have asked. I wasn't in any Audit Committee meetings. Uh, I think it's a fair question. Uh, but, uh, that's, a uh, that's a reasonable question to ask, yes. I have no doubt about that. OK, thank you, Mr Gray. Um, Sir Lewis, I'd like to just briefly drill down into one of the specific areas that I'm particularly concerned about and the Auditor General has been particularly concerned about, and that's prescribing yes. in NHS Tayside. It's been identified as one of the key, and for years now, as uh, one of the key things that the, that the board needs to get a grip of. Um, I, you know, I spend uh, all my time in, uh, in the locality of NHS Tayside and in Dundee, and I continually hear stories about people, you know, their uh, repeat prescriptions not being checked for years and years and stockpiling medicines and all of this. Do you, I mean, I've read your rec your, the parts of your report on prescribing. How, to what extent is this actually, um, you know, uh, is going to be solved? You know, when when is this going to, uh, are GPs actually in control of this and also secondary prescribing in hospitals? Do you think sufficient progress is being made? It was identified as recommendation number five. Um, we said that efforts should continue unabated because we recognised that A, there were discrepancies in describing and uh, prescribing across the piece in Tayside. And, and Caroline, uh, I perhaps might, might, might bring you in relation to that specific. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, it, it was clearly identified as a recommendation. I think as a support team, we also recognise that within our core membership, we didn't have particularly any expertise in prescribing. Um, and therefore, we um, engaged with the effective prescribing division at Scottish Government. So Alpna Mayor and Simon Herding effectively provided us with advice on that. And they engaged very closely with the Tayside team. So um, I think our, in, our, in our second report, um, we did... Uh, identify that there were some improvements that have been made in terms of, and again it was down to putting in place processes that would enable improved prescribing practice. One of the things that I think progress had been made on was the number of polypharmacy reviews that had been, that had been undertaken, so actually reviewing what medications were being prescribed for people, and that is an ongoing, on, ongoing process. We did, um, in, in um, September, we had a rating on that of red, 
um, uh, sorry, and then we, we move that to Amber um, based on the advice that actually that we could start to see some developments. I think it will still be some time before that starts to come through in terms of financial savings. The developments that allowed you to move it from red to amber are these polypharmacy reviews? In, improvements in polypharmacy reviews, improved um, clinical... For the layman, exactly what that is, just briefly. Yeah, I'll try, because I'm not an expert in this area anyway. But, it, but, but Sorry, that, that concerns me as well. That, I mean, the Auditor General has identified prescribing as a problem in NHS Tayside for years now. But there was nobody on the review group with specific expertise in this area, and you had to refer back to the Scottish Government on it. And Is that's, that right? But that's exactly what we recognised early on, was that we needed, um, from, from the first week, that we, we needed expertise in that, and we were able to access that within Scottish Government. So, effectively... So, Lewis, should you not have had somebody on your team who was able to drill down into this? But Al Alpna Mayor and Simon Herding effectively became members of the team, and they were part of the... Yes, team. well... Prescribing is a long-standing interest of my own uh, chairman uh, in relation to my clinical practice. And uh, you will see in the first staging report that we actually extracted a bit of a board uh, minute in relation to prescribing. I had also attended during the, the subsequent um, uh, period between September and J December a prescribing management board meeting to look at myself and witness the progress. I, am I satisfied with the progress? The answer to that is no. Uh, but it has moved to Amber it, in your staging report. It has moved to Amber, Amber on account of processes, in particular reviewing, Pro re repeat prescribing. So prescribing happens in is two there, ways. Is there, any evidence, is there any evidence that prescribing has reduced? The rate of increase in Tayside prescribing uh, has been less than the, the Scot over the last year has been less than Scotland. So the rate of increase has been less. Okay, well, but there's well, no evidence that it's reduced. I think what Sir Lewis is explaining is that that um, in general prescribing has increased over Scotland over the whole of Scotland sure. over the last year. So and the fact that Tayside has increased no, by less than that, that yeah. does indicate yes. that they have made some progress in reducing. Indeed. Can I clarify that, yes, uh, Chairman? Please. Yes, uh, uh, In terms of medicines volume, there was a 0.7% reduction year on year versus a 0.3% increase for Scotland last year. Okay. So, I mean, These are figures provided to us by the, the move, NHS Tayside. The movement on your warning, I mean, the evidence for moving it from red to amber, it's, it's, not, it's not all that convincing. There are more polypharmacy reviews. I think Caroline Lamb is just about to explain briefly exactly what that is. Yeah, that's that's like effectively looking at reviews of, of patients who are on medication and looking to see that they are being prescribed the right things. Um, there is a process of, of rolling through, working through, delivering those. Okay. Did you speak to any GPs about prescribing during your review process? There was engagement through the prescribing management group. Um, so Alpner and Simon were both engaged in that group that involves both pharm pharmacists and clinicians, including general practitioners. Okay. It just seems to me that the, the movement from red to amber, there's not a lot of evidence to support that because the rate of increase of prescribing might be slightly less than the rest of Scotland. But there isn't, there isn't a, a real weight of evidence that Im big improvements are being made. Uh, and and I think that that's Would you why, agree with that, that's why we that? wouldn't go any further than AMBER, because when we were rating it as AMBER, we were recognising that processes had been put in place, but they were left yet to deliver impact. OK. I, I would also say, Chairman, that we particularly tested that. When the AAG met with the TST, that was the particular rating that I myself uh, had concerns that we were perhaps been over generous. Okay. So I, I share your... Uh, I, I share your, where you're coming from in this matter. So you were more inclined to, rate, to keep the rating at red, Sir Lewis? I would have said, I, we, accepted the, we accepted the rating and the, ra and the rational, rationale for that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of tangible progress, in terms of change on the ground, that's yet to emerge substantively. Yeah. So that is behind your point. I, I would support your view. Yeah. So the people who are telling me that their pres prescriptions have not yet been reviewed, and in your view, that's probably the case, that I, that's not I, yet happening. I cannot comment on that. What yeah. I do know is there's a great deal of commitment within the NHS Tayside to get this right. Mm -hmm. They recognise that they've much more to do, and I clearly want them to 
from my perspective and the perspective of the AEG and the transformation support team to continue in that regard. So Lewis, let me ask you, <coughs> transformational change on this level, I mean, I believe that public uh, services must constantly be reformed and refreshed to, to meet uh, the demands of our, of our population, our citizens. Um, have you seen transformational change on this scale that is required by NHS Tayside? Have you seen it happen anywhere else before? I don't just mean in Scotland, but anywhere. I have not uh, been a world, world traveller in relation to observing transformational change, but transformational change can happen and does happen in other health systems. Uh, in Scotland or...? Uh, be in, in worldwide, in terms of the literature. Uh, but transformational change in Scotland is something that I became particularly interested in in relation to my the Out of Hours Review, which I led three years ago. And I quickly recognised that to do that would require a whole system approach which never had been attempted before. So the answer to your question is, are there massive evidence of transformational change in Scotland? Not yet, but there's a clear recognition that it needs to happen. Do you think um, there, that NHS Tayside management has the requisite skills to deliver this or experience to deliver this on the scale that is required? At our assessment in March to June, our staging report assessment, we took the view that NHS Tayside required urgent and additional skills to help them expedite that journey. When is your next report, Sir Lewis? I've been commissioned uh, by Mr Gray, along with Caroline Lamb, to look at the situation again in September this year. Now, in the light of recent circumstances, which we've been discussing earlier today, that may change in terms of tempo, in terms of intensity. Uh, and that's something I'm sure will be discussed following uh, your committee hearing today. Okay. And I am open personally, as, is, as, my, as, my, as I'm my colleagues, to continue to support NHS Tayside through this journey. So we should expect uh, the next report um, at the latest September, is that correct? I think Mr Gray will need to agree with you the timing on that. That is an indicative timing at the moment. And as I say, in the light of recent events, I would need to look very carefully uh, at how that might be conducted in terms of uh, change methodology and, and, and so on. Can I thank you? Uh, may Kerr. I have one more question? Liam Kerr, yeah. Just very quickly to follow up on something that Kavina's just said about, uh, so it was recommendation 11. Uh, you talked about uh, the Scottish Government ensuring the necessary skills and uh, expertise and support are made available. Yeah. Uh, so at the point when you, that recommendation was made, did you or do you have a clear idea of what skills were missing uh, and from which positions uh, from either the people that got into this situation uh, or were lacking in an ability to get out of the situation? Two particular areas were identified and that was uh, financial skills, uh, which is again the reason Mr Gray became involved, and secondly a gap, an omission, was strategic planning. Now that has been made good in the form of an interim uh, director of strategic planning and as we say in our uh, uh, note on our report uh, submitted at the end of December, uh, we, we believe basically that that needs to be looked at permanence. In other words, there should be a director, of, a substantive director of strategic planning uh, in Tayside. And that was a notable finding and an early finding in relation to our staging re report work. Thank you. Can I thank you all very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I'm going to suspend the committee for a comfort break until 9.57. Thank you.
I'd like to welcome our second panel uh, of witnesses this morning. Paul Gray, Director General Health and Social Care, Scottish Government and Chief Executive of the NHS in Scotland. Gordon Wales, Chief Financial Officer, Scottish Government. Professor John Connell, Chair of the Board of NHS Tayside and Leslie McClay, Chief Executive, NHS Tayside. I'm going to open questioning this morning. Mrs McClay, how often do you go through the accounts of NHS Tayside? So I, I will be part of um, a, a, num a number of um, activities, so clearly part as the board, core member of the board. Um, I'm a member of the Finance and Resource Committee, which meets monthly, um, where there is a detailed review of our financial plans. Um, and then I'm involved in the financial planning process from uh, leading the director team. So how often would you say that is, that you sit down and go through the accounts of the board? I think it's less about going through the accounts of the board. I think it's part, part of the role in terms of building the financial plans, then reviewing the progress against those plans. So I, I would comment that it is a regular uh, feature in terms of my role, both in a kind of governance point of view at the board and also review process at, at our monthly finance and resource committee. You would say you're very familiar with the accounts of NHS Teesside? I think I'm very clear around the progress of the budgets and the, and the overall makeup of the budget, but clearly, as Chief Executive, I have a Director of Finance, um, just like I have a Medical Director, Nursing Director, and that accountability uh, and professional role is undertaken um, and delegated to them. So how often do you sit down with the Director of Finance and ask him about what is in the accounts? So we will. So I. So in, in any board, and, in, and certainly in, in my board, I have um, weekly director meetings, which we will look at a range um, of um, aspects in terms of the performance, governance of the of the uh, of the board, um, and financial reviews certainly are a feature of that. Um, but I would say the kind of formal review would be happening at our Finance and Resource Committee, which is a subcommittee of our board. And then uh, we have a finance report that goes to the board at every single board meeting. Okay. So we heard from Alan Gray that the board knew about the deferred expenditure. And we know that from the Grant Thornton report uh, that your director of finance, who has since retired, uh, knew about the e-health funds. So did you know? In, in terms of the issue that we we're discussing today, I was no, I was not aware. You weren't aware. No, I wasn't. Okay, but if the board were aware, and your director of finance were aware, why weren't you aware? Okay, so I think I think what the the independent review of Grant Thornton indicated within that that um, the board, the director, uh, and executive team were not aware of the e-health allocations that had come in. Um, what Mr Gray, I believe, was referring to in terms of the board knowledge and my knowledge was the size of the deferred expenditure budget that we had. And he made reference to um, the fact that it, it was bigger than um, we would like it to be. Um, so I was aware of the size of the budget. Um, I was also part of the board meeting where we instructed that we wanted a reduction in the size of the deferred budget and that we agreed um, through our audit committee and into the board that we would have a five-year plan to reduce the size of the budget. Where of the size of the deferred expenditure, the 23 million? Yes, okay. I was. And did you ask what this was made up of? Like, so, I refer you to Ian Gray's question to, to Alan Gray. Yes, so, so the, the, the finance director produces reports, uh, which he will provide to the finance, to the executive team, to the finance and resource committee and to the board, and the deferred expenditure total was in there, but it was in grouping. So the size of this budget, at 22.3 million, there was not a line by line detail of every single item. Did you ask for that? No, I didn't ask for that. No. Why not? Because my finance, in terms of the size and scale of the reports that he would bring, it, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to ask for a single line. I mean, our budget for our board is clearly about £800 million, and I don't have a line-by-line -line account. I wouldn't expect to have that. But you're the Chief Accountable Officer for NHS Tayside. You sign off the accounts. Yes, I do. So why would you not ask 
what this sizeable sum includes? Because as the accountable officer, I also have a director of finance that I am relying on in terms of providing the financial information that comes through me and into the board. So you just trust your legal advice, your financial advice, your clinical advice, and don't ask further questions? Of course not. Of course, there is a level of governance and scrutiny that happens within the board and I would conduct as chief executive, but there is also a level of accountability on those individuals to bring the relevant information to identify the risks and raise those through myself and into the committees and into the board. But Ms McClay, I mean, I, I think most people would, um, would expect that level of accountability to rest with you. I mean, it strikes me that if you did not ask what that deferred expenditure includes, then you weren't asking the right questions. So, as I said, I think the, I think from the Grant Thornton report, you will see that there were small sums of money. Um, there was a review clearly undertaken. Sorry, what were small sums of money? The allocations, as they came into NHS Tayside, did not come in in one figure of 2.53 um, or 2.63 million pounds. It didn't come in like that. Um, when, when reading the review, it was clear that those e-health allocations that came into NHS Tayside came in in small amounts. But this has been ongoing for six years. Yes, and that's that's clearly... So the first time I was made aware of this was on reading. Obviously, I was made aware of it. And then the detail of that, my first awareness, and indeed of the, and the board's awareness, was on receiving of the Grant Thornton Independent Review where clearly it says it's, it has been practised since 2012. So what questions do you ask? If, if you don't ask what the deferred expenditure includes, if that's not a question you ask of your director of finance, what questions do you ask of him? Clearly, I think, I think your question was, do I ask on a line by line? I don't ask for a line by I line. I didn't use the phrase line by line. I think you used that phrase. My contention is here that you are the accountable officer for NHS Tayside. 5.3 million has been misaccounted. Um, there was a clear, there's clear knowledge from the Grant Thornton report that your director of finance knew about this. We now discover that the board knew about this, but you're telling us today that you didn't know about this and you didn't see fit to ask about so it. So I, I think, so, Kavina, I, I think the um, my understanding from the independent review is that there is a statement that says that the board was not aware neither were the executive team or the leadership team. What we were aware of was the size of the de deferred. Um, budget that we had and that the board was taking steps to reduce it. Mrs McLean, it's your job to ask these questions, is it not? So I, I think I've described in terms of the process of review that we have, but not that level, that, not that single level of detail. It's not your job to ask what the deferred expenditure includes? It's not your job to, to be across the accounts to so, that level, is that what you're saying? So the Director of Finance produced a level of detail in what was included in the deferred expenditure, and that was in, in groups and under titles of things like earmarked reserves, and there would be a figure there. What was not provided was um, a, sing, a single uh, levels of detail. However, Mr Gray has um, already indicated that since being aware of this, I, too, I have taken immediate action, and we have now changed the level of reporting that will come to the Finance and Resource Committee and will come to the board, and that's now with immediate effect. The picture you're giving me is that the Director of Finance presents you with the information that he wants you to see, and you blithely accept that. I think, and I, I might be wrong about this, Paul Gray might be able to clarify, but I think chief executives of organisations are expected to have sufficient training that they can ask the requisite questions of the, the people who are presenting them with this information. I think that is your job and that is the job of the board of NHS Tayside. So why weren't these why weren't you asking him these questions? There was a number of questions and reviews that would be done around the financial performance and that also is the remit of the Finance and Resource Committee of which I am a member of and that committee every four weeks in Tayside undertakes a review of the performance. We are also reliant as committee has already discussed on findings and information coming through audit committee, both from internal auditor and, and clearly external auditors as well. But I would certainly reinforce the level of review that is undertaken by the Finance and Resource Committee, and then there are always detailed finance reports that go to every single board meeting. And Pick this up. 
I, I think the report clearly indicates that it was unlikely um, that, that this would be picked up, and I think that's been reinforced by by Mr. Gray in terms of his earlier but submission. I, I'm sorry, but I, I'm confused. The Director of Finance knew about this. That's clear. Would you agree with that from the Grant Thornton report? That the Director of Finance knew about the 5.3 million? Yes, that's, okay. that's what the report says. And Alan Gray told us that the board knew as well? No, I think Mr. Gray said the board knew, knew the size of the deferred, deferred expenditure. expenditure. I, think, I think the independent Did, report so is... Why, so why didn't the board ask what that deferred expenditure included? Would you not expect that level of scrutiny on your well, board? Clearly, with the information that we have now, then yes, I would agree with that. But there was it was the level of reporting on how that deferred expenditure was made up clearly did not give sufficient detail for those questions to be asked. Why didn't you ask? Because I, there, was, there was never any risk identified to me or to the board. In relate, there was a risk in terms of the size of it, but not in terms of what it was made up. And, and you're relying on internal audit to review your allocations that are coming in. And there was never any risk identified that there were inappropriate allocations coming into our board. That was never a risk that was identified. Ian Gray. But the thing, surely, that we can't understand here is that the board knew of the £23 million deferred expenditure. And I think he said the board agreed measures to reduce that. Yes. But how could they agree measures to reduce that without knowing what activity it was which led to the deferred expenditure? I, I, I mean, that, that's, that's the question you saw me put to, to Mr Gray. I, I cannot understand. So, how can the board have satisfied themselves that measures were being taken to reduce the level of deferred expenditure without knowing what the activity was which had led to the deferred expenditure? I think neither myself or the convener can see how that's, sure. that's possible. You would have to know what is being going to be done differently. And to do that, you would have to know what the activity was, which had not taken place in the year that led to the deferred expenditure. And therefore, you would need to know a, a, a breakdown, line by line or whatever, of, of what that deferred expenditure was. So, so I agree with you with, with the now with the level of information that we have. But all I can say to you is that there was never any risk identified in terms of um, what those allocations were. The size was there. But a risk was identified in terms of the size of deferred expenditure. It, yes, it was. An it action was. was agreed, yes, except action, yep. that the board then didn't know what that action actually was. So, so they the, couldn't the, have. So the, the internal audit recommendation was to reduce it. That was what their recommendation uh -huh. was. And the board then instructed, through the Director of Finance, to start to reduce the so, level of reliance so on So the board were in a position where the internal auditor had recommended a reduction, but the and the board agreed that, but had no idea then how that reduction would be achieved. So the reduction could have been achieved by taking the money out in notes and setting fire to it, and that would have been fine. The board, that would have met what the board had agreed. Is that right? No, clearly that wouldn't have been acceptable. Well, well but they wouldn't have known. It, 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 that's the point. If they didn't look at what was in the deferred expenditure, they could not have known what the measures would be. And if they knew what the measures would be, they must have so, known that the e-health money was yeah. in that. Yes, yeah, so, uh, and I, so I, I'm not going to disagree in terms of what your, um, your your statement there. What I would say was the description of what was in the deferred expenditure was in a level of grouping and it wasn't in a level of single detail of what every allocation that had come in that had been used in the deferred expenditure. That level of detail wasn't there. All I can say now is that that level of detail is now going to be reported to the board. But Mr McClay, if you're leading this level of transformational change, you just clarified that the board didn't ask these questions. How can you you must be across all the change that is happening in NHS Tayside. So if the board is agreeing change to happen under these groupings, you must have known what that change was. So as Chief Executive, you're absolutely correct. My responsibility is to lead and oversee the transformational change within NHS Tayside. Um, I have a group of executive directors who I delegate a level of accountability, and I have governance and assurance processes in 
um, in terms of ensuring that that has done that that is the role um, in terms of myself, and that is the role that I have been endeavouring to do um, through the delivery of the transformation programme, which I think. Um, the advisory group does recognise some of the progress that the board has made over the last 12 months. With hindsight, do you think you've delegated too much on this, on the level of detail in the accounts? In, in terms of, in the finance space? Yes. So there isn't anybody more disappointed to be here in front of the committee on this issue. Um, there is a level of accountability, clearly I am, I am the chief accountable officer, but I also delegate and I, and there is a level that you have to trust. And uh, um, if there is nothing coming through an assurance process of risk, then you have to trust that accountability to be delegated effectively. And you are reliant on individuals and their professional accountability as well. Do you feel that, with hindsight, you did ask the appropriate questions of the Director of Finance? So, I. I <laughs> I think um, clearly we have taken further action, but um, I have to go back to what the Grant Thornton report said, and they said clearly there were failings on governance across three parties. But I think what's important is that the independent review said that they believed there was nowhere, no awareness um, by the board, by the executive team, and that it was unlikely due to the nature of the transactions that we would have been aware. Do you feel you have um, sufficient experience on the board? Because if you weren't asking these questions and the board weren't asking these questions, is there f sufficient financial experience on the board of NHS Tayside to actually take this transformational programme forward? Yes, I believe there is. And, and I think there is a, there's, there's clearly more detailed reporting that we have to do, but, but I think there is um, the skill and capability in terms of board members. Are there any accountants on the board? Professor Perhaps Connell. I could contribute here, yeah. Ms Mara. Uh, firstly, can I confirm, as Liza McClay has done, extreme disappointment and um, a sense that we would uh, feel we have been let down and we have let down the committee by this uh, occurrence with the Grant Thornton findings. But yes, the board does have financial expertise. The chair of our Finance and Resources Committee, which is now our Performance and Resources Committee, is Mr Douglas Cross. A qualified accountant that's in a long term and distinguished career with Police Scotland as an accountant. We also, as chair of the audit committee, have Mr Stephen Hay, who is a, an investment banker. So between the two of them, we actually have a significant uh, input into our financial management and audit. Thank so you. So I believe the board does have that level of expertise. If I can maybe just clarify uh, what you were alluding to, the board, uh, as Ms McClay has said, did not have awareness of the 5.3 million within the deferred expenditure. What the board was aware of, as you have been told by Mr Gray, was that the level of deferred expenditure was higher than it should be. All NHS boards have a level of deferred expenditure. It's the nature of the way NHS finances work year on year. So deferred expenditure in itself is not unusual or necessarily inappropriate. What was unusual was the reliance that NHS Tayside had on deferred expenditure within its accounting system. Within the detail of the deferred expenditure, the e-health monies, which were totally inappropriately within the NHS accounting system, were broken down into smaller items. So they were not bundled up as a 5.3 million chunk. They were bundled up into smaller levels, which actually were probably below, below the value at which one would normally expect a board to be told about transactions, all under £1 million. Now, whether that was done deliberately or not, I cannot speculate. But... The Grant Thornton report has made it clear that there was no visibility of this 5.3 money, 5.3 million pounds within the deferred expenditure, and I would point out, as Mr. Gray previously did, that NHS Tayside had been subject to external audit by Audit Scotland and previously uh, Grant Thornton, no KPMG, uh, PwC. PwC. I'm sorry, there's so many, there's a, so many initials. PwC, Ernst and Young, the Assurance Advisory Group, external audit internal audit, all have gone over our accounts, none picked up the fact that there was an inappropriate level of money, money within our deferred expenditure uh, level. And that level of scrutiny does give me some concern because if none of that picked up this, it does mean that I suspect it would have been impossible without someone owning up to the fact that it was there. 
But Professor Conlon's scrutiny is to is independent eyes to check that public money is being spent properly. Um, I would I would argue that I mean you sign off the accounts of NHS Tayside also. And I would expect with a programme, I think the whole committee expects, and with the programme of transformational change, that you would be aware of that level of detail, especially in deferred expenditure, especially when the board has agreed to reduce it. And perhaps, But these questions, it seems, have not been asked. I mean, you chair the board. Did the board think to ask about how these savings were going to be made, or, or did you ask? Yes, indeed. The but as Mr. Clare said, the deferred expenditure covers a, a very wide range of activities. It is money which comes in all throughout the year to cover uh, a number of Scottish Government uh, determined priorities for NHS spend, including other activities. E-health is just one small part of that. And when we asked the Director of Finance to reduce the level of deferred expenditure, what we were asking him to do was to ensure that money which came in was spent in year and not carried forward into following years. So if we had an allocation of money for the sake of argument for an IT system, we wanted to be assured that it would be spent in that financial year. Now, sometimes the, the allocation of deferred expenditure monies comes in in the final quarter of the financial year, and it's physically often quite difficult for NHS boards to, to get that money spent in time, which is why it becomes deferred expenditure. It's as the, 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 the item is carried forward into the following year. So what we were asking really was for a Director of Finance to carry forward as few activities as possible. But we did not ask to be given line by line itemisation of what items he would be spending money on and not on. In hindsight, we might have asked him to give us headline uh, notification of the, the larger items uh, so that there was some awareness of which activities we were going to be spending on and which we weren't. It's very easy to do that in hindsight. In, in, Thank you. Know, but as I say, the fact that all the external scrutinies did not note this uh, it doesn't give me comfort, but it's the, what I rely on when I sign off the accounts to be given an assurance that our accounts have been audited and are acceptable. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you. Sure. The previous panel uh, made reference to a deep audit by the strangely named EY. Um, who commissioned that? EY and Sir Emerson Young. That's that, that's what they would be referring to. So that was commissioned by us as part of the um, run into the assurance advisory group work. How much did it cost? As far as I'm aware, Mr. Beatty, and I'm happy to provide the uh, committee with more detail, the sum involved was £211,000. Really? £211,000? Do you think you got value for money? Yes. Really? Why is that? Because the uh, Ernst & Young report provided um, a basis on which uh, Sir Lewis Ritchie and others could take forward the work that they did. Uh, so I think had, they, had Ernst & Young not done the work, somebody else would have had to do it. I do boggle a bit at 211,000. It seems an awful lot of money. It's the going rate. Uh, it, we didn't pay over the odds for that kind of advice from that sector. And you believe you got a good result out of it. But they didn't pick this up. It's a, if it's a deep audit, surely they would look at all the processes and every element of it. And for 211,000, I would expect it to be forensic. Well, mm, a forensic audit would be a, would be a different thing, and we didn't commission a forensic audit. I suppose, <coughs> Mr Beattie, I, I do not wish to present to the committee some analysis that says this is a good situation. It is not. It is something uh, about which I think, I mean, to call it disappointed would be putting it mildly. But what Grant Thornton said was that the process by which this uh, money was being transferred had been embedded in the board's financial planning and financial reporting processes for a number of years and therefore has masked the underlying operating position of the board. 
They then refer to the, the lack of challenge by the board, which we've just spoken about, and they say this, we think, is due to the lack of reporting of the transactions, as the knowledge of these transactions seems to be contained to the NHS Tayside Director of Finance, NHS, NSS eHealth and eHealth Leads Group. They have been, in effect, off-budget reporting transactions. And as colleagues have said, we have to rely on the assurances we receive. Other Otherwise, there is no point in having these assurances. And these assurances have come via a range of routes that have already been described. These transactions were, in my view, carried out in a way which was intended to obscure them from the board of NHS Tayside. And that is what happened. But the same report, Grant Thornton report, also says there was lack of controls in place in NHS Tayside around these transactions. That's accepted, and we have they, they have changed the controls. There were equally the, the controls ought to have been different around eHealth and NSS. I have I have removed financial account uh, finan responsibility for making these transactions from the eHealth leads uh, in response to this. In my experience, auditors focus a great deal on all, th all the different forms of suspense yeah. accounts, deferred payment accounts, all those things, because that's where you hide things. So auditors focus on these. Now, we're told we've had PwC, we've had Ernst & Young, we've had goodness knows who all involved in this at whatever cost, and yet they still don't pick up this basic element. Mr. Beatty, we rely, all of us in our jobs, rely to some extent on the fact that people are transparent and tell us the truth. Otherwise, you know, we, we, it's just, it would be impossible for any of us to proceed. You rely, you, this committee quite rightly relies on me to tell you the truth and to be transparent, and I do that, as you know. If someone doesn't, yes, checks and balances will We'll, we'll deal with it up to a point, but we're reliant on honesty and integrity. And you're saying honesty and integrity was not there? Well, um, I've said what the Grant Thornton report says. The um, <clears throat> knowledge was contained in a particular way and wasn't passed on. Um, so the board effectively was misled. I would say so. Coming back to what Leslie McClay said, she stated that she relied on internal audit. Do you think internal audit should have picked this up? So uh, I think Mr Gray's already said, uh, what I said was I uh, clearly we rely on our internal audit and our governance processes but with the detail that we have around this, I can understand why it wasn't picked up. But in the overall uh, figure for these deferred payments, you also said the internal audit had recommended reduction. So they had re recommended reduction in the size. So they, their focus was around that we were relying too heavily on deferred expenditure. Did and, in, would uh, internal audit have known the content of the deferred expenditure? I'm, I'm probably not in a position to answer that question today. Mm. I mean, looking at this, we had pro we we had issues that we raised previously about internal audit in connection with NHS Tayside. That's when the problems first surfaced, and you know we could not understand why uh, the situation developed as it as it did without that being properly uh, reported, and. Here again, you know, I have some doubts as to what internal audit's doing if it doesn't pick this sort of thing up. I mean, it is a classic situation where uh, a business or operation puts funds through the books over the year end or whatever over the reporting period in order to make the situation look better. That's the sort of thing I would hope would be picked up. Paul, can I interrupt you there? One moment on the general internal audit 
point to bring in Ian Gray? So, so to follow up, uh, Mr Gray, on the point you were making is that your view in the Grant Thornton report indicates that the, um, the, the sum was accounted for in a way to hide what was happening from the board. Um, in the Grant Thornton report, it says, the email trail appears to indicate that the Director of Finance at NHS Tayside was planning on using the e-health money as part of their overall income that year, and that the Director of Finance at NSS was aware of the situation. So is it the case then that the Director of Finance at NSS was part of that knowledge which was hidden as well? It's possible an NSS are conducting an internal investigation. Colin. So, again, that brings a question in about NS NSS internal audit. Did they fail to pick this up at their end? So, Mr Beattie, we're straying into areas which are out at the very limits of my technical competence, but I'll I will try to answer your question as best I can, and it may be that, that, that Mr Wales can assist. The, the distinction I make between NSS and NHS Tayside is this. NHS Tayside's end year accounts, if I'm, and forgive me if I don't use exactly the right technical words here, Represent that would have represented them as having £5.3 million available to spend, which in fact they didn't because they were going to have to give it back. So, so in other words, the, 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 the position looked £5.3 million better, or would have had we not intervened, would have looked £5.3 million better than it should have done. So that's, that's Tayside. NSS weren't going to spend the money in the year in which it was allocated and did return it, which so far is the right thing to do. So their books are not misrepresented. But they returned it through a budget exchange mechanism, which had originally been designed as a strategic reinvestment fund. I'm going back now to 2011-12, which was a legitimate process which had over time been changed into one which was now effectively recycling money. So something that started as a process whereby if you had not spent all the expenditure that you had intended to, you then made that available for reinvestment. That's entirely legitimate. Where it strayed from legitimate was when that money began to be used as a recycling mechanism, which should not have happened. And that's what we've put a stop to. But there are still questions, both with NHS TSA and with NSS, because the report, Grant Thornton report, says and talks about inconsistencies and quality issues in connection with NSS. Uh, challenges that were out of the normal and should have been challenged and raised at NSS. So there's a lot of questions there as well. It's not just NHS Tayside. There's two sides to this. Indeed, Mr Beatty, and that is why uh, I have ensured that NSS are carrying out proper investigation of that through their governance processes. And when that investigation reports, which I expect to be within the calendar month of April, then a decision will have to be made on what further action is required, but I don't, uh, you know, you'll appreciate. I don't want to preempt the outcome of that. Just one last question on this, um, Lisa McClay, You rely on internal audit, <coughs> and you've stated that. Are you satisfied that the scope of internal audit, as it stands, gives you the reassurance that you require on the financial situation of Tayside? So in light of the situation that we now yeah. have, and I think Mr Alan Gray made reference to that, we are revisiting that um, with the information and evidence we now have to make sure that any risk, that if there is any risk there, then it will be covered uh, in our 18-19 audit plan. So that's been part of the immediate action that I've taken. Okay. Would you expect board members to ask questions around deferred expenditure? In general, yes. And why do you think that hasn't happened at NHS Tayside? 
Well, I think it has, but I think the detail was obscured from the board, and I think that the board has acted reasonably once the detail became available to it. You said you think, you think it has, but I think we've already heard this morning that the board weren't asking these questions, although they had the information presented. It was presented in quite general terms, and the questions weren't asked. Would you not expect your health boards around Scotland to be asking these questions? I expect, them to, I expect health boards to act reasonably. And what I mean by that, because I, I'm, I, your question is a fair one, is they have to scrutinise what they have before them in, in a way which probes the detail. However, if some of that detail is obscured, then I think it's asking a lot for people to notice something that they can't see. Is it a reasonable expectation that the Chief Executive would ask for that level of detail? Well, I'm running this through the lens of what I would do. And I find it, I genuinely find it difficult to know how I would have done something different if it was presented to me that there is a, a packet of expenditure, deferred expenditure of 23 million, if the components appear reasonable and there has been a process by which it has been allocated, it is entirely possible to speculate about what one might have done with different knowledge, but I think what NHS Tayside did with the knowledge it had, and I'm speaking about the board, was reasonable. Whether the internal controls were strong enough, it's already been accepted that there'll have to be a review of internal audit. But, I, but how could you agree to take action to reduce deferred expenditure when you didn't know what it was? Because that's, that's effectively what we've been told that the chief executive, the chair and the board did. Yes, and you can take action and the action can be reasonable and proportionate. And if the components look reasonable, then the action you take will look reasonable. So you're satisfied that on one of your health boards in Scotland, the management team and the board aren't asking these questions to the extent that we now have £5.3 million just misaccounted for? I'm you're not, happy with that situation? No, Ms Mara, I didn't say I was happy. I think we've all said we're very unhappy. But what I am saying is... But you're satisfied that that situation can be allowed to continue? No, we've stopped it. But it's been going on for six years. Through a process that was, as I've explained to Mr Beatty, originally designed for something else and was changed over time, which should not have happened. We've taken away the response, the authority from the eHealth lead so that it can't happen again. But I am in genuine difficulty to see what a person can do when they're presented with information that is designed to give them one impression when in fact the facts are different. But Mr Gray, we're not just talking about, um, you know, your uh, politicians or, you know, the man in the street. We're talking about chief executives who are highly trained, highly effectors, lead leaders, strategic leaders with forensic abilities, but you wouldn't expect the board members or the management to ask these questions? I would, ex I would expect them to seek the relevant assurances. That is how any chief executive works. They have to work on the basis of the assurances that they have, and they have to make sure that these assurances are sound. This case that didn't happen. shows exactly that that didn't happen, but it didn't happen because there was deliberate obscuring of the information. Liam Kerr. And on that note, after 35 years, you have a finance, a director of finance, uh, who's working for NHS Tayside for uh, around 35 years, one way or another. He's deliberately obscuring information, uh, walks in and retires without notice and uh, any uh, forewarning. Uh, is that really the situation? That wasn't quite exactly how it happened. OK. Um, so... Um, if, if I may, I'll just briefly tell you in terms of the process. So when I was alerted to the, the, that there was a situation regarding our year end, and that's how it was presented to me, um, on my assessment of that, my immediate action was that I needed to undertake an internal 
uh, review and investigation uh, into the governance. Um, I also wanted to quickly understand what this was going to mean for the 1718 position in terms of the board and obviously going forward the 1819. I took the view that in order to carry out an open and transparent investigation that I would take management action with the Director of Finance and that's what I did. Uh, and so at what point does that management action, which I assume is management speak for disciplinary action? No, no. Go on. No, so it wasn't. So, so I took the action to suspend the Director of Finance and that suspension was done, which is available for me to do that in such circumstances. That was taken as a neutral act and that was to allow... To, it, was allow, it was to allow me to ensure that I had an open and transparent investigation. It was to protect the board and it also was to protect the individual. So my immediate action, clearly you wouldn't go into any, you can only go into a disciplinary situation once you've got evidence and facts that there has been some misdoings or wrongs and clearly you would take action thereafter. But the immediate action for me was to investigate the issue and so I carried out a suspension of the individual. But at that point... Uh, the individual turns round and says, no, he didn't. actually... No, he didn't. So, so how did that turn into a retirement? Um, so anyone who's part of the NHS um, pension scheme can make the decision to retire before the age of 60, and that is open to individuals. Um, the suspension was enacted on the individual, and, um, I, and also it's probably important to say that I took senior HR advice in relation to the situation that had presented to me made that decision um, and then started the internal investigation. Um, that was on, well, that was, on Mon that was on Monday the 26th of February that yes. that occurred. And um, through uh, his, the trade union representative, um, there was an indication to the HR person who was leading the investigation for me in terms of that part of it, um, we were given intention that he wanted to retire. And so that was accepted? I mean, well, the, 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 you don't the, accept it. He just retires. He says, we, we, I'm, we, I'm, "I'm not in a position to." It's, it's, um, I don't have a remit to be able to approve that. If somebody makes the decision to retire with immediate effect, then that isn't a decision that I can either prevent happening. I understand. And what payments would have been made uh, at the point of retirement? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so that the the individual and any individual who took that decision, they it would just be what their entitlement was, and their entitlement is a payment in terms of their notice period and any annual leave that they were due. They, and anyone who takes early retirement, I think committee members will be aware, then has a reduction um, on their pension and their lump sum. So um, that's, that, that is adjusted if they're taking early retirement. So just to be clear, there was a lump sum payment made, uh, a payment in lieu of notice? No, so, sorry, what I'm saying is, so it, it was the normal entitlement of any individual in the NHS was um, um, provided for uh, this individual we're talking about. Yes, I, I appreciate that, but just to be clear, so there would have been a payment in lieu of notice, uh, which after 35 years would be a three, three months? Mo three months, <clears throat> yeah. Right. Uh, was uh, the Director of Finance professionally qualified and regulated by anybody, do you know? Um, yes, he was. Um, and apologies, I've probably for, I've forgotten the name of that body. But but I, 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 have, I have... I can tell you. Oh, CIME. Right. Uh, now, we've talked, we've heard there about, uh, I think you said honesty and integrity was not there. We've heard of misreporting. Uh, I think I may be paraphrasing, Mr Gray, but uh, that the information was willfully excluded from the board. Uh, has a notification been made to the regulatory body, Mr Gray? The answer to the question is no, but that is because we uh, contacted the regulatory body to establish that they were already in possession of the facts, so they were. So reporting it twice would have served no purpose. I understand. So, but something is being done by the regulatory body, to the best of your knowledge. That is correct. Uh, because, uh, Leslie McClay, you talked earlier about a level of accountability. Yes. Uh, in what way are you aware that the former Director of Finance being, is it being held accountable? Are you aware of the Director of Finance being held accountable in any way? I'm certainly, I'm certainly in discussion with Scottish government, government colleagues. I was aware that there was an engagement with his professional body. Mr Gray, um, just moving, moving away from that slightly, if I may, was the Scottish Government wise to entrust millions of pounds a year to a group which Grant Thornton concludes were not financially aware? 
This is the eHealth Leads. Hmm. In retrospect, no. So what's the government going to do with that knowledge going forward? Well, we've removed um, delegated authority to commit expenditure. Mm -hmm. Why did the transfer request made by N NSS not raise any concerns within the Scottish Government Health and Social Care Directorate? Because it was seen to be part of a process that had existed since 2011 and there was a failure to detect the fact that its purpose was changing. Mm -hmm. uh, but leading on from that, the Cabinet Secretary for Health leads the Health Directorate, which in turn is responsible for the eHealth Strategy Board, and yet no one from the Cabinet Secretary downwards at any point said this looks amiss or raised any red flag. Does that concern you at all? I, I have thought quite hard about that, Mr Kerr. Um, if you think of the situation where you have a group of e-health leads whose responsibility is in relation to digital and in relation to project and programme management, mm -hmm. and there is a process for a strategic reinvestment fund, and they are being they are using it in a way that appears to them to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. And, at, 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 if you like, at the bookends of that process are two finance directors, mm -hmm. one in Tayside and one in NSS. I think I would be speculating to answer your question, you know, should someone have picked it up? I mean, if I, if I, you know, if I was given clinical advice by two doctors, I think I would generally be inclined to accept it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, but that, that, that is a fair point, because the e-health leads are not finance people. I think that's the point you're making, yeah. isn't it? They're, they're IT, they're um, operational. Yeah. Uh, but final question, if I may convene, from Grant Thornton's report, there are a significant number of people uh, in e-health, in NHS Tayside, in NSS, who knew what was going on. So who is going to take responsibility. Who will be punished for this, Mr Gray? Well, I think you... Well, I'll not tell you what you may think. I'll tell you what I think. Um, I think that the finance director of NHS Tayside has left work earlier, as in some years earlier than he meant to, he has, as Ms McClay has made clear, uh, therefore uh, had an actuarial reduction in what he would otherwise have received by way of pension and lump sum, and his professional body is considering his position. That seems to me to be a fairly significant weight on a person. Mm -hmm. um, I have reviewed the situation in relation to the e-health leads and have removed <coughs> delegated financial authority from them. I don't regard that as a punishment, but I regard it as an appropriate action nonetheless. And I will await the report from NSS before making any decisions about what to do about it. Thank you. Professor Connell, uh, one of the last times you came to committee, we talked to a bit about the bonus payments that uh, management NHS Tayside had received. Um, can you tell us when the last round of those um, payments were considered? Firstly, I suspect it would be, for the sake of accuracy, best not to call these bonus payments because I think Mr Gray has also clarified at an appearance before this committee that these are pay increments which are made for senior staff within NHS Tayside. So, I think bonus is a misleading word in that circumstance. But they're judged on a criteria they're of satisfactory on a criteria of performance. performance. You're quite yeah. right. Okay. Um, so in terms of the annual cycle, it runs essentially a year behind. Right, yeah. So the payments to recognise performance for the financial year 2016-2017 would be enacted during 2018-19. Last time this was considered was 
for the previous year, 1617. So if, if you're getting to the point of asking about the payment made to the finance director, it would be based on his performance in the year 1516 that would determine his level of pay in 1617. So his pay in 1617 would be determined by the assessment of, of his performance in 1516. Okay, and was in the last round of these performance awards, was he awarded an increment? To my understanding, he was. And that would indicate that um, the judgment on him that was satisfactory performance to to receive that increment, is that correct, that bonus payment? The triggering of an increment is based on a performance which would be deemed either satisfactory or higher than that. And by, without having the facts in front of me, my recollection is that he, he was deemed satisfactory in the year 1516. Okay, so he received his increment in that year? In that year, yes. How about the rest of management? Um, again, without having the, the details in front of me, I am working from memory, but my recollection is that no members of the senior team were deemed less than satisfactory in that year. So every member of the senior team in the last round of bonus payments received one? If I can again point out, these are not bonus payments, they are pay increments which are determined by the Scottish Government. I think it's important for the sake of accuracy to note that. If I call them incremental payments, the last round of yes. incremental payments, every member of the management team received one? I would need to confirm that, but I think that is correct. Yes. Is that correct, Mrs McLean? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I wonder if I could turn to the transformation agenda. Uh, uh, perhaps this is the bigger issue for NHS Tayside and perhaps other NHS boards in Scotland to embrace this change agenda. But what I want to ask you is why is it taking Professor Ritchie to come along at this stage and make us aware or make us at least think that a transformational change is required in NHS Tayside? Why haven't you done that on, under your own volition? I could ask that of Mr Gray and Mrs McLean. If I should perhaps pick that up first, Mr Coffey, and I think it's a fair point. I think I would contest the fact that it was only when Professor Sir Lewis Ritchie was appointed on the insurance advisory team that NHS Tayside understood the need to transform its business. I became chair of NHS Tayside just about two and a half years ago, and it was at that time that it was very clear that Tayside's operational expenditure was greater than its incoming revenue and that there was a need to transform its activity. In the first period after that, significant effort was made to try, if you like, to um, carry out a fair amount of transactional activity to, to halt the rate of over-expenditure, but with a clear recognition that transformation of our operations was going to be required. It was very clear, as Professor Sir Lewis Ritchie pointed out, that transformation takes significant time, but the Board did embark on transforming its activities in the year 1516 and 1617. It was at that stage when it was clear that the pace of transformation was insufficiently rapid and that we were still having difficulties in matching our operational spend with the available revenues that Sir Lewis Ritchie's assistance was uh, brought in. So transformation has been on the cards really for over two years, but the pace has been picked up in the last year. In terms of evidence that some things are happening. You asked Caroline Lamb for evidence of transformational change. I think there are some genuine transformations happening. Perhaps the easiest one to cite is a major change to the way in which Tayside will deliver its surgical services in the future, uh, a process called shaping surgical services, whereby in the future acute uh, unscheduled surgery will be delivered out of only one site. In the past, that has been delivered out of two sites. So transforming the way in which we deliver surgical care will be better for patients, but will be more sustainable in terms of workforce and finance. <coughs> so that was a process that began before Sir Lewis Ritchie was in place and will continue in the future. There are other major transformations to the way we operate, which are ongoing at present. I think it, I mean, it certainly gave me the impression, I don't know what the rest of the committee members feel, that <coughs> that kind of pace of change or indeed the transformational change that he was referring to had been evident within the NHS side, but we perhaps disagree in interpretation of that. But uh, are you confident, as Mr. Gray, are you confident, and Ms. McClay, are you confident that you have the skills, the capacity, and otherwise within the NHS side to carry forward this transformational agenda so that we're not sitting here again perhaps next year in a conversation like this? 
I'll maybe pick that up just to start off with. I think um, there is no doubt, I think, in terms of the health board and NHS Teesside and probably other boards, that um, there is a challenge around capacity. Um, and that, that's just because you're relying on individuals doing their day job and in terms of managing patient care um, and at the same time being part of the redesign process and the transition process in terms of new services coming in while still managing the existing services. And I think we're, we were clear as a board that there, um, that there was gaps in our capacity to do that and there were probably were particular skill gaps um, as well. So the opportunity that our board had through the um, the AG review and then the transformation support team in particular was that they they they've provided some additional capacity, some additional expertise for us. You know, even just skills like um, program management skills, which are not inherent in, in a number of boards, and you need really good program managers to manage. Once you've once you've worked with your clinicians, with your staff side, with your frontline staff and the public to agree, as Professor Conn was talking about, this new model in, in, in how we deliver surgical services, you've got the existing model going on, and then you need you know skills to, to manage a detailed program, manage all the risks and the things that go with it. So we have been fortunate um, in terms of getting support through this transformation support team and there are still individuals who are working with us and I foresee the requirement for that over quite a significant period of time. I think the skill gaps will change. Um, we're also trying to um, develop our own individuals so when we have expertise so working from other organisations coming in that we are also doing training and development with our own people so that when they leave they've got that additional skill but there is no doubt an organisation like ours with the, the scale of the transformation change that we have to deliver we will require ongoing additional support and capacity beyond our current workforce. Could I ask the same question of Mr Gray, is this kind of transformational change agenda that clearly NHS Tayside are being asked to embrace, are we seeing that in other NHS boards in Scotland or are we going to see the same issues cropping up where external support might be required for a period of time to, to bring the skill set within the organisation? Could you just give us a little <coughs> flavour of what that looks like across the landscape? Well, I, I think that most boards, most organisations benefit from some external support to uh, assist with transformational change. I'd be quite concerned if we got ourselves into a position of thinking that external support was always a bad thing. You know, that it was it 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 it, it was always an evidence of some kind of uh, failure or default. I mean, uh, I I think that having people who have change management and organisational development capability and, and qualification and experience is hugely important to driving forward change. The effect and benefit of a fresh pair of eyes, I think, can't be un underestimated. And sometimes when um, organisations have got to a point where they think they've exhausted all the possibilities, a fresh look at it can open up new avenues of consideration or make people revisit something that they had perhaps discarded as an option. So I, I, would, I would not only expect but welcome um, further change management capability and transformational change capability being used in NHS Scotland because I think it would be entirely beneficial. And the, lastly, are you satisfied that what's been put in place with and for NHS Tayside is, is sufficient and adequate to, to get us through this period of transformational change that we require? I have asked NHS Tayside, rather than submitting their um, uh, final plans for 2018-19 by the end of this month, which in effect would be today, to uh, do so by the end of May because I want them, based on what we now know and all the things that have come to light that we're aware of, to reassure themselves that their plans are sufficiently robust that, and that they have the capability and capacity in place to deliver them. I also have asked uh, Sir Lewis Ritchie to maintain uh, his uh, oversight from the Assurance Advisory Group perspective uh, so that I can be provided with assurance that these plans are being developed in a, a, in, in a robust way. So we are providing additional support 
to Tayside, and we stand ready to support them in uh, gaining more, more support and assistance if that proves to be required. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Liam Kerr. <coughs> Very briefly, if I may, Mr Gray, um, just to follow on uh, from that line of questioning, the, uh, a degree of brokerage has been given to NHS Tayside, and uh, just for, for anyone watching, that's, it, it's a kind of interest-free loan. Uh, if, is that fair? Um, I, I, I will accept your definition. So, uh, there's 33 million of brokerage uh, has been given. I, I think you can see because of the uh, issues we've been looking at earlier today, there might be a little more brokerage needed. Uh, that being the case, you've deferred it for three years, the, the repayment. Uh, so the questions begged are, uh, how much confidence do you have that this level of brokerage will actually be repaid to the public purse? Uh, it, it's necessarily a fixed sum, therefore the sum you will get back in three, four, five years will be worth significantly less to the public purse than it is as at today's date. Uh, and is there any implication for the rest of the NHS budget uh, of having put this amount of brokerage into NHS Tayside? Okay. Right. I'll try and answer your questions in an orderly way. Um, I had already indicated to the committee an intention to uh, provide at least four million of brokerage in this relating to this financial year in addition to what was already provided. The, the, the very sad fact about the 5.3 million on which we have concentrated most of the questioning is it was in effect additional brokerage which had we been asked for we would have given. So that, that's the unfortunate fact about it all. So that if you add 4 and 5.3 you get 9.3 that's not difficult arithmetic. However, one of the things that I have asked um, NHS Tayside to do is to assure themselves that in their estimates of expenditure they have removed as far as they possibly can um, an optimism bias. So my expectation is that as we close off the end of this financial year, which we are now approaching, my expectation is that I will provide brokerage to Tayside in the range of 9 to 12 million. That's my expectation. And they will be able to tell me more about that after the board meeting this afternoon and after some final work that Alan Gray is, is leading. So that will take the overall brokerage into the, you know, into the 40 millions. So that's the answer to your first question. Um, will we get it back? Do I have confidence? I have a strong expectation that we will get it back. My confidence will increase over time. Has it been detrimental to the rest of the NHS? No, because it's not that NHS Tayside have money and it just disappeared down a hole. It was spent on for legitimate purposes on patient care and other things. So, so there has been benefit from this expenditure. Will I be glad if I get, say, £45 million pounds back in three years' time that I can then recycle into other things? Yes, I will. Just to be clear, when I say there's no detriment to the NHS, quite clearly the money has gone to NHS Tayside and yeah. it will have been used. Yeah. But that money has come from somewhere. So from which budget has it come? Is that somebody else's budget? Has NHS Grampian uh, not received 33 million as a result? No. So the, there, are, there are always in a budget of 13 billion pounds end year adjustments and we... The opportunity cost. Yes. Is what? Is what? And to whom? Well, it's... It's very difficult to speculate. I'm not disagreeing with your question. It is, a, it is fair and appropriate. What could we have spent 33 million on that we didn't? Well, the answer is I didn't know because we didn't plan to. So it's not that we had some plans that we then cancelled and said, no, we'll not do that. We simply didn't devote 33 million to some other board or function or purpose. It was devoted to NHS Tayside. Bill Bowman. Thank you, convener. 
Good morning, uh, Mr. Gray. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to continue on the on the 5.3 million yeah. and the Grant Thornton report, which um, of course I've read and it's quite clear and I think it's a good report. But in my mind, it's what I would call a limited report because there were specific um, instructions given to them, basically to look at certain controls and look at um, the accounting of. of you know, these transactions. And they do mention in several places that their work did not constitute an audit or a forensic examination and there does not provide the same level of assurance. And the conclusions are based on the documentation provided by the various um, bodies, bodies concerned. That gives me a slight worry because we've been, um, you know, you talk about, you, you take things, what people tell you, you have to take some trust in that. But yeah, I'm not really clear from this exactly who knew what and when. It doesn't mention, I don't think, um, the retiral of, of the finance director or anything you know, he may have said. And there's a, there's a link being made here that um, you know, that person left because of something that had been done uh, in the past. And you've used terms like detailed being obscured. D do you plan to have a forensic examination so we can really get into you know, the detail of this? I had not at this time planned to do so because a forensic examination would uh, imply that there was some information somewhere that, that you didn't have. I mean, that's, that's what a forensic audit, as I understand it, would normally do. It would go and look for things that you didn't have or, you know, thought might exist but weren't sure where they were. I think we have pretty much all the information that exists. What I would say, as I would always say to this audit, this committee, is if the committee were to uh, wish to make a recommendation about um, further work that it wanted to see done, I would take that very seriously. But I think we are taking it pretty seriously already. I mean, we've, you know, we've commissioned a report as quickly as we could. We've got the results pretty fast. We've taken a number of actions as a result of that. Um, Alan Gray, who is, um, uh, you know, certainly one of the best finance directors uh, I know, is going through now in a level of detail the accounts of uh, or, or the, the, the budgets of NHS Tayside, uh, which he is now able to do because he he has access to all of that detail and. I think there's some fairly thorough looking being done, and I can't imagine, and I, I'm not going to speak for Audit Scotland, but I can't imagine that having heard all that they've heard, that they're not going to take a fairly close look uh, at issues uh, connected with this financial year and may review previous financial years as well. So I think the level of detail we have gone into is pretty substantial, um, but as I say, if this committee had a recommendation, I would pay close attention to it. Obviously, we'll come to later. But I don't think there's a doubt that we have the figures and we've seen the schedule of the reversing entries, which is a bit of an audit trail in itself. I'm still not just convinced. And sometimes when you read these reports and it just has um, titles, it's a little bit harder to follow exactly who is who, that we're exactly clear as to when people knew or didn't know or exactly what they knew. Um, what discussions maybe took place about year-end balances? You know, could this be improved? Could that be the presentation be improved? The board, as I understand it, are saying we didn't really know about this. But did the finance director actually hold his hands up and say, I did all this? Should I pick us up? I appreciate the points you're making, Mr Bowman. Maybe I should start by saying that the audit committee of NHS Tayside remains very concerned, not about the what, because I think the what details are actually quite clear, but about the how and the, the governance aspects of it. So the Audit Committee of NHS Tayside are at the present time putting together a remit for a further externally re led review of the detail of exactly what you're asking, who knew what and were there opportunities missed for this to be picked up. So while I've given you assurances today that I do not believe that there has been anything missed. Our audit committee have asked for some further assurance about, you know, why was this missed for so long? 
In terms of the, the, the titles and you allude to a number of names, I'd point out that this arrangement dates back to 2012, and when we talk about Director of Finance, it actually was a different to Director of Finance in NSS from the current one, and a different Director of Finance in NHS Tayside from the current one. So actually the arrangements when they were set up were established by a different set of people. But the, what I think has been the difficulty is that they've been continued through time. So it's become almost part of... I think Mr Bowman had a direct question. Did the Director of Finance hold up his hands? Well, that was, I was, I, I think say, Ms. McClay was Ms. dealing McClay with that, weren't she was yeah. going to deal with that. So, so what, what I can see is that my first awareness of this was when the Director of Finance um, advised me of it. Well, advising you of an issue is different from saying I was the person who perpetrated it. So he advised me of the issue. Um, on further questioning, I, I was aware he clearly had knowledge and that was when I then made the decision to do the internal investigation. Now, whether there is a forensic examination or your external review, I think it would be interesting to know what you're actually proposing before I would um, push on that. And perhaps will you have some oversight of that? Yeah, um, we'll we'll discuss it. Absolutely. Yeah. And my finance director, Christine McLaughlin, will, 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 will expect to see that. It may be, I, I wonder, um, uh, convener, would it be helpful for us to write to the committee with the terms of reference of that external review? Would that, would that be That's useful? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Bowman, are you... Uh, just, just one final point. I mean, you've used uh, a term, detail uh, obscured. Um, now, if I go back to my sort of auditing days, if something is hidden, then you would expect the checks and balances to find it. If there is collusion, it is much harder because there's more than one person involved. Now, how sure are we there was not actual collusion um, here? Because we're, we're focusing a little bit on the NHS Tayside and the other you know, parts of the organisation. You know, was there a collusion to misrepresent the Tayside accounts? So I've already made clear that NSS is doing an internal investigation and we shall see what that brings. Um, I think, uh, well, no, I'm not going to say what I think because that's that's the road to ruin, frankly. Um, I expect... I expect you to be honest with you. The committee, Mr Gray. Yeah. Oh, indeed. But Great. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> no, sorry, I, 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 all I meant, convener, is I'm not going to speculate okay. because that will not okay. lead to an honest response to okay. the committee. It will just lead to my speculation. I expect, I think I should more fairly say, that the external review that Tayside are commissioning, about which we have spoken, will bring further clarity to that detailed point about who within Tayside knew what about what when. Um, I have a, a, I don't, I can give you it, but and I'm happy to read it out if you want. I have a timeline here of what we knew when, but you know that may not be the line of questioning you're pursuing. No, I think it'll be helpful if we get that. But, um, proposed um, terms of reference. Just one final question. Do you intend to withdraw, correct and reissue the NHS Tayside accounts for the years concerned? Well, that would be a matter for discussion with Audit Scotland. Because well, I think it's for you, isn't it? So, yes. The, you own the accounts in that I would, sense. I would wish to discuss that with Audit Scotland in terms of how we might go about that. So what that's on your agenda? Yes. I mean, we... I will need to have advice, bearing in mind that what we are saying is that for a number of years the position has been misrepresented. I will need proper advice on what, how one rectifies that situation and at what point the um, changes become material. Well, I think they're probably material in the sense that we're discussing them at great length. Here. Uh, yes, it's sorry. Just money. All, all I mean is there may be some years in which the differences were not material, there may be others in which they are. I do not I simply do not know, but I'm happy to respond to your question by saying yes, that is something I am okay. considering. Thank you. Mr Gray, did you see the first panel of evidence this morning? I I'm afraid I wasn't able to know. I, okay. Um, um I asked Sir Lewis Ritchie um, a couple of points around his his report, uh, which was published before this subsequent issue of the £5 million came up. But I was particularly interested, as I have been before, in the prescribing issue at um, 
NHS Tayside and the detail that um, is in his report around that. Um, I can't remember his exact words, the official report will tell us uh, later, but um, he indicated that he was perhaps a little uh, wary of the movement from a red warning to an amber warning on uh, the, the prescribing issue. Um, I, I had really wondered if you had seen the evidence and how you felt about that indication from him. Uh, no, I hadn't, but um, I think in uh, response to your earlier injunction about being honest with the committee, which I trust I always am, yes. um, I uh, ha I'm aware, or anyway, of Sir Lewis's concern about that particular issue. Uh, he and I had a brief conversation earlier this week, and uh, you, you, you may recall uh, that um, I had previously uh, engaged the Deputy Chief Medical Officer to look at the issues around prescribing and um, I think my intention would be to ask Gregor Smith, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, uh, just to come back and provide some further assurance and support on the prescribing issue. That, if I may say to the committee, is one of the areas in which I'm very keen that what I earlier described as optimism bias is weeded out. I think what Tayside are proposing to do on prescribing is spot on. Mm -hmm. I still wonder whether um, the ambition they have expressed exceeds the likely rate at which progress can be made, because it is a relatively complex issue that requires a lot of persuasion of a lot of people. So I think they're doing the right thing. I just want to be sure it will happen as fast as they think it will. In your view, Mr Gray, what drives that rate of progress that you say is necessary? Well, it, it, Engagement, above all, um, you know, in, in English, speaking to people, uh, it's 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 not a, it, you know, it's not a complicated technical process. But decisions about prescribing are multifaceted, and um, also there are historical practices. And I'm not suggesting they're all bad or wrong. But if people have done things in a particular way for many years, you're asking them to do it a bit differently. So I think, I think engagement, persuasion, ensuring that both clinicians and the public understand what we're actually aiming for, which is better prescribing, these are the things that I think matter. The people that are being asked to make this change on the ground, um, presumably this change isn't easy to make or it would have been made before. How do you think th this issue about £5.3 million just being misaccounted for. How do you think that will affect their confidence to see through the change that they're being asked to make when they look at the newspapers and they look at Scottish Parliament and they look at the board and think, well, they're not asking these basic questions around where this money is, so why should we make that change? Do you think that will affect their confidence in any way? I genuinely hope not. I. So three things. Firstly, I never operate on the basis that if someone else has done something wrong, I'll not do something right by way of some kind of response to that. And I don't expect um, colleagues in Tayside would, would take that view either. Secondly, the 5.3 million, as you yourself said, convener, and rightly, has been misaccounted. It hasn't been misspent or, or it hasn't been uh, used for something that it shouldn't have been. It, it, as I said in response to earlier questioning, it's just a great shame that it wasn't asked for as brokerage because it would have been given and then the, the situation would have been exactly the same as it is, except that it would have been properly represented. And the third thing is, what we are seeking to do on prescribing in Tayside is consistent with best practice and with the principles of realistic medicine. I think all clinicians will subscribe to that, and I think it's a, an important task to engage with them respectfully, which I know that Tayside are doing, and to ensure that this is carried through. Mr Gray, you're effectively the mortgage broker for any health board that is running a deficit. That's right. And effectively, NHS Tayside have reported a false account to you when they've come to you for brokerage. Are you in a position to be 
granting bro brokerage when the accounts are not accurate to the extent that they're not in Tayside? So there has been a misrepresentation of 5.3 million. That has been uncovered and fixed. Um, now, my confidence in what has been done so far, particularly as led by Alan Gray, is strong, and I am therefore confident in giving brokerage to NHS Tayside. The Grant Thornton report said uh, specifically that there were a lack of controls in NHS Tayside that led to this situation. How do you feel then about senior management accepting an uplift on pay based on performance when those controls didn't exist and have led to this situation? I'm not a party convener to the performance discussion uh, in, in health <coughs> boards um, and uh, I think it would be difficult to answer your question. But you're in charge of all the health boards in Scotland and effectively in charge of all the senior management and we have a situation throughout Scotland where people can award each other performance payments but this board has been running a deficit and been running a mistake in their accounts for the last six years. Well, can, <coughs> increments are um, a contractual entitlement as far as I understand it uh, and if I'm wrong about that I'll correct it but that's my understanding um, and there is a process to decide whether they should be paid I am um, happy to place on record that I will expect Tayside to think very hard about this year's round. Thank you. Ms McClay, um, the internal and external audit teams, are they being changed, replaced, or are they continuing? So um, there's certainly been no discussion in relation to that. The external audit team are allocated, that's my understanding, to the board. Um, Scotland. That's my understanding, yes. We'll yes. pick that yes. up then. How about internal audit? Are you, do you have the confidence to continue with their services? I think as, as Mr Gray, Alan Gray indicated earlier, he's sitting down with the internal audit team to discuss what our programme for 1819 um, looks like. There's certainly been no discussion from our perspective in terms of whether there's a change required or not, not at this okay. stage. So, yes, Mr Gray. I think when the external review that we've already spoken about has concluded, it will be an appropriate moment to consider the points about internal controls and internal audit and to decide at that stage what that report tells us. Okay. Because it seems to me that internal audit, well, we know that everyone that's looked at this has missed it, but if, if you know, it, it seems to me worthwhile that it's a considered if there should be you know, uh, strengths added to that team to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. Leslie McClay, are you comfortable that the Director of Finance carried the can for this? I think the independent report clearly recognises that there were failings in our governance um, procedures. We have we've rectified those. There's others that ones that we've enhanced. Um, and I think Mr Paul Gray has indicated that um, the detriment to that individual um, is significant. To that individual, but to nobody else. I mean, effectively, he was suspended and then took early retirement. So effectively, he has carried the can for this mistake. Is that right? Well, I think he's, he's certainly been personally impacted by the situation. That's fair, that it was entirely his responsibility and he's taken responsibility. I, I, mean, I, I, th I think the Grant Thornton report clearly states that there was failings across three parties and it wasn't just one individual. The, the job that all of us have to do is to make sure that we rectify and take actions as immediately as possible to safeguard this, a situation like this ever happening again. That's, that's what I see as my responsibility. And you don't feel that you made any mistakes in the questions that you didn't ask the Director of Finance around this? So clearly the, the conversation and the, and the challenge that you've given today you know, I absolutely take that on board. Um, I think the we have already taken actions re regarding further detail within our reporting. I've also instructed changing to our standing financial instructions, which will now mean that every single allocation that comes in to NHS Tayside, I will, along with the Director of Finance, review, consider it, 
and formally sign it off before it then goes through the then financial management process thereafter. Um, and I think, as other people have indicated, we are commissioning an independent review and we will look at those findings further and we will take actions as recommended by that. So you're happy that the Director of Finance, this was his responsibility and your performance continues to be satisfactory and deserves an uplift in payment? So, as I said, I think this clearly has. The, the, it is clear that the Director of Finance had a responsibility. I think the Grant Thornton report um, determines that in relation to my performance. That is a decision that we made by the Chairman and by the Board, and it wouldn't be for me to, to make any statement on that. In terms of the transformational change we're talking about as a whole that needs to be made, I asked Paul Gray about the people on the ground who are delivering this change. Do you feel um, that, given these revelations, you still carry their confidence to make that change? So I think, I think it's already been discussed. The impact of this is felt by every single person um, across um, the organisation. Um, and. But I think also we also need to recognise that we do have a published assurance and advisory group report that was as recently assessed and published in January of this year. And that clearly documents the progress um, through our frontline clinical teams, through our managers, through our engagement with the public and our staff, that there is progress being made within our organisation. We are clear that we have a significant journey ahead of us. Nobody underestimates that. And I think it's important that whilst we build confidence back around uh, any concerns around the financial position um, to the staff of our organisation and the public. But at the same time, we also publicise and commend our staff for the huge amount of work that they have undertaken over the last 12 months. Thank you very much. Can I thank the panel for your evidence this morning? And we'll just take a minute to change witnesses. I move the committee now into private session.